All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I am Colleen O'Connor Toberman, uh, filling in for your usual MCs, Max and Kylie, today. And we're really glad that you're joining us either here in the room or online. This seminar is part of the Roadway Safety Institute's Advanced Trans Transportation Technology Series. As a reminder, these go on all fall. You can see the full list of upcoming seminars at www.roadwaysafety.umn.edu. We also do send out an email announcement about each upcoming seminar, so watch your inbox for those. And a couple of housekeeping notes for our web audience. If you have questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box. We'll read them out loud when we do Q&A at the end. It's also really important for us to know how many people are watching online. So if you could type into the chat box to let us know how many people are watching with you at your location, that's also really helpful. We're required to report our attendance figures for these to the USDOT, and so it's really helpful to have an accurate count. And uh, with that, we are going to have Professor Rajesh Rajamani uh, come forward and introduce today's uh, presenter. Okay, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to um, welcome today's seminar speaker, Dr. Juliana Abel. Um, so Juliana is a faculty member in mechanical engineering, and uh, her research interests are in um, uh, smart materials, smart textiles, uh, wearable sensors and actuators, and she works on uh, medical device applications as well as um, she's starting to work on some transportation applications. Um, Juliana obtained her PhD from the University of Michigan in 2014, and uh, she's been in the news a lot recently because you've probably seen those announcements about um, that big uh, institute on advanced functional materials uh, that, that was funded by the DOD and, uh, and some private companies. And uh, she's one of the two uh, faculty members from the university involved in that. It, that's a big uh, uh, $300 million uh, initiative. So she's got a lot of exciting things going on in her lab. Uh, today she's going to talk to us about uh, her ideas for uh, how some of these um, variable sensors might be useful in um, uh, transportation applications. Thank you. So. So this is a really nice graphic. When I got to the ME department, um, they sent out as a flyer. And it's really interesting. It's showing uh, just fiber form. You can see some of the electrical wires down beneath. Um, and it really, the question of what makes me think textiles me smart is at the foundation of my research. Because I'm interested at the intersection of smart materials research and textile manufacturing processes. So today, I'm here to talk about wearable technologies and smart materials, applications for transportation and safety. So I just started working on a transportation application. So you're not going to see results from that yet. But I'm going to show you all the fundamental technology that I'm developing, that, and you'll see a wide range of applications. I'll try and point out uh, the different types of forms and where they could potentially be used for transportation and safety applications. <coughs> so. Um, when you think about wearable technologies, right away you probably go to these fitness trackers. I'm wearing one right now. I have a Fitbit on. Um, I almost always wear it. Um, but, so you have steps trackers. This one's a basic one, it just does steps. Um, heart weight, GPS, stroke analysis, cycling, every sport technique. I know there's a company down the street that works on a basketball sensor. So they, you wear a sleeve on your arm and you shoot a basketball and it can analyze exactly what's wrong with your stroke or with your shooting shot. Um, and every other t sport imaginable has a wearable sensor to help um, improve your performance. Um, the other leading area is gaming. So we see all these VR devices and there are vests that you can wear that convey information and gloves that help you in the gaming process. Um, the, the other two, um, health, there are a lot of ones that are just reaching the market. So health is a little trickier because you have all these regulations in place and you have to be more precise. Um, so you have sleep trackers, that's already on the market. Allergen detectors, so this, and this is an environmental tracker, so you can sense the quality of the air around you. Um, blood sugar, Caesar, so there's a long list of wearable sensors that people are developing. Um, and safety, so there are already things that man manage your speed, track your speed, um, monitor you for f fatigue. Um, this is a smart cap. It's in development using um, brain waves to sense how fatigued you are. Um, there are systems that 
measure your ergonomic posture, and accident detection. Um, so things like the vest when you're on a motorcycle that it blows up to protect you from a crash. So these are all wearable items that are on the market today. As you can see up here, most of them are kind of gadgety. So the things you pin on, they're accessories that you will add on after the fact. So they're not really integrated to, into what you're wearing every day. So you may forget about them, you may lose interest. Um, so my, the technology I'm working on is really getting all of that information into fundamental units so that it's close to your body, as close as possible, so it's integrated in the clothing structures that you're already wearing. So using those manufacturing techniques that already exist, we have um, a bunch of different textile manufacturing techniques that I'm going to discuss, um, and how do we get these novel materials into those forms in order to provide improved wearable devices. Um, so like I said, uh, wearables are typically accessories. They're not fully integrated into the system. They're, you can lose them or forget them. And what's really been driving wearables have been this great advances in sensors and signal processing. I mean, fantastic advances. We can do so much th uh, for both of these. There's new sensors on the market every day, and there's tons of research being done in those areas. However, the future te textile, this is where my research comes in, is how do you take that information and provide haptic feedback to the wearer? So how do you put it in some form that you can then act on the wearer? So right now, all those devices I mentioned before, it has to be sent to your phone and you check your phone. Occasionally, you might have a buzzer. So when I hit my 10,000 steps a day, my wrist buzzes. But I don't get any intermediary data. I have one buzz. Maybe you get a couple different frequencies, but you're kind of limited. So we want to be able to have actuators that have distributed fe haptic feedback, so in different areas around your body. And then our body is a very complex shape, so we want to be able to adapt to those different shapes. And we have to be able to apply significant force to the body in order of us, for us to notice it. Um, and we want to have integrated sensing and more power. So these are things I'm developing. I'm not going to talk much about, but except for their potential. Um, and so we want to just to integrate this into our everyday items, like the, our t-shirt. So today I'm going to talk about active textiles. And so I'm going to cover both smart materials, so the whole, a broad range of smart materials that have a lot of potential, potential for transportation and safety. And I'm also going to talk about um, textile structures. So what are the manufacturing processes to create these different structures? And what are the mechanical properties that might be unique for these different applications? Then I'm going to talk about active knits. So I'm going to discuss the knit structure and kinematics. So I have an actual knitted structure that moves and can apply force to the body. So these are all going to be in very open mesh forms, but you can always co-knit them with another material um, to create something that's more clothing-like. But you're going to see the foundation for this. Um, and I, my research is very model-based. Um, I'm only going to show, I have, base, I have three levels of models. I'm going to show two slides on each. Um, they're very math intensive and very detailed. Um, but that's really a foundation of how I can expand in this research area is understanding the fundamental behavior of the stresses and strains within the fibers as I manufacture them. Um, I'm going to mention a few future research directions and end with some conclusions. So smart materials. When I say a smart material, I refer to a material that couples two different energy domains. And there are a wide variety of smart materials out there, um, couple temperature, um, voltage, magnetic field, stiffness. Um, and the reason we're interested in these materials is when you're thinking about acting on something, all of our, so you're thinking about a motor. Actuation is like a motor. Um, if you think of our traditional um, motors out there, our actuators, we have hydraulics, pneumatics, and electromagnets. And those are really at the core. And they make our world move. They do everything for us right now. Um, but they're very complicated systems. You can see tons of parts that have potential for failure. They're heavy, large, and noisy. Um, and all of these, you see they're pushing force at a single point. So you're not going to have a fully integrated system if you have these all over your body. Um, whereas smart materials are a material solution. So they're a material. So it's just the material alone. So it's lightweight, compact, and quiet. Um, it's distributed, so it's throughout the structure, so you can get these distributed motions. And you have a simple infrastructure because you're reducing the number of parts. Um, 
So right now, current actuator technologies just can't produce large forces and strains and complex motions um, all in a compact package. So some important smart materials. Um, the one I'm going to talk about today, most today is shape memory alloys, and it has a thermal mechanical coupling. So that means it has, undergoes some change in temperature and outputs a force or a displacement. Um, and there are a lot of different um, vehicle applications. GM has had it on their Firebird, I believe, for the trunk latch. Um, and Boeing has been working on getting these chevrons, active chevrons on planes to reduce surface noise. Um, and the other one that has a thermal mechanical coupling are shape memory polymers. And so they both have the same coupling, but alloys produce high forces and moderate strains, because it's a metal, so 4 to 8 percent strains. Uh, polymers produce very large strains, hundreds of percent strain, um, but very, very low forces. And then you have a couple with electric field and mechanical coupling, so piezoelectrics on electroactive polymers. These tend to operate at higher frequencies. And so you might not use them for actuation as much, but these are great material systems that if you integrate it into a textile, you can then start doing energy harvesting. So you can reduce the amount of batteries you have to carry, and you can start to have onboard power. So the piezoelectrics, um, they're already, they're the most sophisticated smart material out there than fuel injectors and speaker systems. Electroactive polymers are just coming on board, and they're referred to as artificial muscles um, because of the large deformation. They have mu very muscle-like quality. Uh, and then magnetorheological fluids are already in a lot of different automotive um, applications, especially in suspensions. So adaptable suspensions, you change the magnetic field, you change the stiffness, so you can adjust to your terrain. So the material I'm going to talk about the most today is shape memory alloys. And they have this really complicated thermal mechanical coupling. So this is a material science aspect of it. Um, it has this cold, flexible state. And when you heat it, that deforms up to 8%, so you can stretch it out a lot. When you heat it back up, it undergoes a, a solid state phase transformation, and you get this very stiff austenite phase. And so you can use that change in temperature in order um, to provide actuation. So you can think of simplifying this, where you have this flexible, cold state called martensite, and this stiff, hot state called austenite. And if you move between them under a constant force, you go back and forth, you get actuation. So in this case, you're moving from 6%, from 0.5% to 6.25%, so you're getting over 5% actuation strain. Um, and so you can use it to lift and lower a weight. So instead of a motor, a big bulky system, you have this single piece of metal wire that can do significant mechanical work. All right, so where do the textiles come in? All textiles are hierarchical structures. And this is where the opportunity lies. So you have a fiber. Or, so the first level are yarn. So a single fiber, which could be a cotton fiber, or it could be a polymer, or a metal in my case. And then you can create different ply yarns. So you twist different types of yarns together to get different behaviors. And they all have slightly different mechanical performance. And then you have fabric structures. So um, I'm going to go into depth in these e on the next slide, but they all look a little bit different. And because they all look a little different, they're all made differently, they look different, and they have different mechanical characteristics. And so these structures can be combined together to create fabric, full fabrics. And then you can always layer them and then add coatings to um, enhance functionality. So you can imagine at any of these levels, you could start to integrate a smart material wire. So you can use it as a foundational wire, you could use it as a single ply, you could start to weave in wefts, uh, like cross elements through all these structures. Lots of opportunities, you can do coatings of different materials. So you have a lot of areas where you can focus on in order to enhance functionality. So I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about knitting, so um, I'm going to tell you how it's made. Uh, so knitting looks like this. This is what your sweaters are made of. Your t-shirts are knit. If you pull on them, they're very stretchy. They have this J shape. This is a strain hardening behavior. So you, initially, it's very flexible, and it starts to stiffen after a while. And that's all to do with this foundational structure. You see this loop? It follows this torturous path. There's lots of bending strains involved in the structure. Um, and you can get this structure by hand knitting. There are hobbyist knitting machines, and then there are CNC knitting machines. Um, and so you can produce these at different levels. So for prototyping, I do a lot of hand knitting and hobbyist machine level. And then as I move to a finished product, do 
um, investigate the CNC machine knitting so I can control all the aspects of my structure. Um, and knitting is used in a ton of technical applications already. Body armor, composite reinforcement, a lot of um, carbon fiber composites. Medical graphs, seeding is a big one that has a large impact for, potential impact for automotive in industry because you're already using this process to create seat covers. So then if you can integrate fibers into it, you have this very intimate um, connection with the wearer that you can convey information. And then heavy duty seals as well. So weaving is really just parallel fibers. You're scaling everything in series and parallel. Um, and they're made using these traditional looms. So again, you have a hierarchy of different um, manufacturing techniques that you can use to create these. And if you look at the mechanical performance, usually it just scales up the mechanical performance of a single wire. So you're just adding things in series and parallel, and it doesn't change the performance all that much. So whatever your foundational material acts, that's how a woven structure is going to act. And so a weave is all, are all of your dress shirts. So if you think about putting on a dress shirt, it doesn't give much. It's much more rigid and um, maybe doesn't drape as well. Um, and wovens are used a lot in composite reinforcement, geotextiles for things out on the side of the roads for doing, um, to prevent um, uh, wash away on the side of the road, um, airbags and other inflatables. So if you use a woven structure, very rigid, so it can also hold a pressure if it's woven correctly. So lots of potential to integrate smart materials to maybe change the shape of an airbag, um, depending on the occupants, so you can maybe tailor how far out it goes. And adhesive tapes are also typically woven structures. Um, the other ones I'm just going to mention briefly, braids um, are pretty much just woven structures, but you might add a little twist to them. So because of that twist, you're going to get slightly different mechanical performance. Tufts are what your carpets are made out of. So you could think about this as you put a smart material on these layers, and you put it a tufted piezoelectric um, carpet on the bottom of your floor. Maybe every time you move around in your car, you're actually gathering energy from that motion. Um, and nets are very breathable, and they have lots of knots. So they have a very predictable structure, but they give along their shear lines. Um, and non-wovens are, are great for filters. I mean, this is a huge market for filters. And if we can have a tunable filter, we have a lot of potential of how we do air filtering throughout our, uh, throughout our vehicles. So now I'm going to talk about active knit. So I'm combining that shape memory alloy material, or the SMA material, and the knitted structure. Um, so you saw this before, a very torturous shape. But when I'm looking at performance, I have all of these design parameters that I can tailor. So wire diameter, loop spacing, height, loop shape, number of rows, number of columns. So if you want a performance, I just have to tweak all of these parameters. And, I have the, and that's why I have so many models, is because it helps me tweak the parameters. Um, and then depending on the t pattern, I can do surface texturing. So instead of a nice smooth um, structure like on your sweater, think of like a fisherman sweater where you have a texture structure. And if that further acts out of plane to act on your body, you could have some feedback given through that mechanism. So just like textile structures, um, knitting is hierarchical. You have the single little loop that is made on your knitting machine. You combine it in series and par parallel to get a knit pattern, a homogeneous knit pattern. And then you can do different knit patterns in different areas, get spatial distribution, a heterogeneous pattern. And then you have restructured grids, so combining these in 3D form. So that's creating our clothing when you're actually making seams. So the first level is a knitted lo loop. And I'm going to say knit and purl. It's basic knitting lingo. Knits have the ridge in back. Purls have the ridge in front. And they're the same exact thing. They're just flipped around. But how you combine them in a matrix is very important. Um, so a knit looks kind of like a V. You can see a V shape if you follow these red lines. And the purl has the loop in front, so it looks like a dash. So, but a knit and a purl loop don't do anything on their own because they have to be constrained by their adjacent loops. So we have knit patterns. So these are all, uh, these are homogeneous patterns. So say if I put all knit stitches, one side is going to be very smooth, one side is going to have a series of ridges. That asymmetry, when you heat it up, all of a sudden you have this scrollable object. So this is really, I, I did a summer fellowship at NASA and looking at things like this for deployable space structures, things that can furl and unfurl on demand. And so you could expand this to maybe um, 
I mean, it would be silly, but like a convertible top where you automatically have this fabric that does your the rolling instead of a hard, rigid top. And then another one is garter. So you can see we just have horizontal stripes. So you can't really tell the front from the back. When you heat this up, all your loops open up in plane. You get this large contraction over the surface. Um, so you can get planar contractions on the order of 60% from these, and it can go back and forth. Um, and I've looked at these to change the shape of a wing. So a lot of the things that I've done looking for, for the Air Force and for NASA, you can translate this for automotive because the flow control issues are very similar. So if you can change the surface of a vehicle, you can keep your boundary layer attached. So you're talking having a more structural textile surface that would be an aerodynamic surface. And this rib has vertical stripes. And so the vertical stripes creates these ridges when you heat them up. And then depending on how you knit them, you can get really nice sinusoidal waves. And then you could offset them, and you can get sinusoidal bumps in different areas. So you have a really great option for creating um, distributed roughness el elements on surfaces. And then diagonal creates arches. So you can imagine maybe in your seat, if you wanted lumbar support, you have these arches that push into your back. You could actuate them and have your fabric automatically fill that void and provide some support to you. And grid patterns. So those are all very basic motions, but you can combine them all over a garment or a fabric textile and get um, specific motions in different areas. So this is half stocking net and half rib. And when you combine them together, this, the rib portion creates those accordion waves, just like it did before, and the stocking net flips over and covers it. So you're in this very compound behavior. Um, and so you can combine any of those homogeneous stitches I talked about to get a more heterogeneous, tailored performance. And then a lot of opportunity comes in when you're connecting them. So you can connect things on the edges, and you can create belts, and belts that can have these deployable booms structures, or can change in diameter. And so anything, you, so if you um, connect it across the, the different dimension, you change in diameter. And so that means if you have a garment, then you can apply a compression to your body. So if you have this knitted structure on your body, you heat it up, it can kind of squeeze you in different areas to mean different things. Horse, so you can also do 3D shaped. This is just a long, thin tube. I'm not sure where it would have many applications in automotive, but it's neat. It creates a spring. Um, and then you can do 3D shapes. So these, this is a little triangle, but because of the boundary condition, it creates an airfoil-like structure. So you actually get a little propeller out of it. And then by crossing over links in the middle, you can get twisting. So all of these are very traditional knitting stitches that you could do by hand or with a knitting machine. And you get these very predictable behaviors out of it. Um, and the other thing, all of these were very rigid. So this is kind of an extreme. I made this prototype for an aerospace application for um, uh, a smooth surface. And it's very rigid. So when I pull on it, it springs back. So you're not going to want something like this on the body. This is not like your clothing. But the cool thing about this material is you can shape set it. And so that provides drapeability. So initially, um, it's very rigid. It wants to return to that curled shape. But I can shape set it so it's flat. And now if you think about your t-shirt, if you hold your t-shirt up, it collapses and drapes down. And so I have this post-processing I can do that I can still get this to actuate and change stiffness and provide mechanical force to the body, but now it kind of resembles more of a traditional fabric. So I still have that high force, but it's a nice flexible structure. So my lab focuses on model-based design. So I'm going to talk about some of these models. So I talked about a lot about the kinematics, all the different motions I can get. So I can choose based on the shape, the structure, or the architecture of the knit, how it moves. But now if for each application, I'll need to have a relative force level. So I'll need to say, OK, I want it to display, displace by a certain amount and provide a certain amount of force. Um, and so. There's this really rich body of data that covers knit models. Um, it goes back to the 50s. Oh, the f oh, 47. Oh, 37 is the earliest one. Um, so they've been modeling knit structures a really long time. It's a hysteretic system. It's very complicated. Um, so that's why it's been going on so long. And it was just recently in the 2000s that they started looking at engineering materials for knitting. 
Um, and so, but even if you look at all of these, none of those move like the, all those videos I showed you. Um, so I kind of had to find a couple models and build off of them so that I could get the motion involved. Um, and so you saw this video already, and so try that distributed contraction. And so this is the 2D model, so it's just predicting this in-plane motion. And so if I were to use it for an application, this is linear, but it could be wrapped around a surface. So it has some initial length, and I stretch it out when it's hot, and it stretches just a little bit. And I let it cool down, and it stretches out a lot more. And when I heat it up, it contracts. And so you imagine after the manufacturing process, you're just moving between these two states where it's cold in your body normally, you can actuate in a certain area, you can heat up and squeeze your, squeeze your body to get, provide that haptic feedback. Um, and this two-dimensional model uh, uses euler bernoulli beginning and Alaska theory in order to predict both the force and displace displacement. These are pretty messy structures, and you saw the inconsistencies. Um, they repeatedly give you about the, the same curve, so you know you have the same peak area for all of them. And the model is able to predict within 6% error the maximum actuation strain. So even with all that hysteric behavior, we can still predict how it performs. So now I can go through and use the model to tailor how dense is this knit and what size wire it is and things like that to, to maybe match the body's performance. And then when you get to 3D modeling, so the one that created those, the um, peaks that come in and out of plane, um, you can imagine having those push into you or provide lumbar support. So you need a 3D model if you're going to actuate out of plane. And so this, if I continue that old modeling approach, is really, really messy. Um, and when you're just trying out and trying to figure out what stitch and what, um, what wire to use for different wearable devices, you want to go through a lot of iterations. So this is a really modulable, tractable model. So I just say, what's the most important thing this knit loop is doing? In this case, it was twisting. So for that rib structure, it's twisting out of plane. Um, and if I model that twisting well, I can get the motion of the, the whole knit structure. Uh, you, so you saw a movie of it where it created these peaks. But when, you heat, but when you machine knit it with a good machine, you actually get a nice sinusoidal wave. So something like this could even be used as a safety device to create a padded area. Um, and so the model, even though it's super simple, it has a linear elastic material and a linear elastic geometry. By combining them, I'm able to roughly predict the behavior of the structure. So I can use this to kind of do my tinkering. So before I start to dive in and say, this is, these are exact parameters I want for my wearable device, I can go in and play with my numbers. So I can get a, or so I can know approximately what dimensions I should be using. And then this summer, I worked on creating a geometric model of the planar stitch, um, a finite element model. Um, so it's very robust. So it uses the exact geometry of the structure. It parameterizes it. Um, it and then so I make a prototype. I have a parameterized CAD model. I import it into Abacus. And using um, NASA's smart material element that captures uh, the mechanical performance, I can get a really detailed finite element model that does all of the friction. So for most of these wearable applications, there's too much error in, the in your physical movement already, so you're not going to want this fidelity, of a, this level of fidelity for a model. It's, this is really for those aerospace applications where the performance is very, very particular. Um, and this is just the beginning. We see the strains in the right areas and um, the order of magnitude of displacements are correct. Um, but we need to build this up to have more um, RV ge geometries. So there's a lot of material science work that has to go on this and a lot of finite element tweaking in order to get the friction just right because the friction is so important to the structure. And so I wanted to show you um, a flow control application because a lot of these were wearables, but what I've worked on before is all structural. And so they have tremendous potential for structural elements. So anytime you have flow over a surface of a vehicle, you have to maintain your boundary layer. Um, so if you think of an aircraft wing, you have flaps and spoilers and things like that. You also have roughness, roughness elements, and those are all there for very specific reasons. And then some synthetic jets have been in development for a while, and those typically use a piezoelectric element to create a puff of air to keep your boundary layer attached. Um, and then you also have these contour bumps that are important for supersonic flight. So this is the application I've worked on before. Um, but if it can do supersonic flight, if it's capable of those, we could use it for a car for sure. Um, 
So I found out that in addition to all the whole vast array of design parameters I had before, I could add them, stack things up, and add them um, and nestle them together. So I can further enhance the mechanical performance. So it really gives me the ability to tune to any performance I want. And by stacking three sets of two in a row, I'm able to reach this adaptive flow control regime. So I can actually have this composite structure, which I didn't build, I'm working on building it now, but that can pop up and create an, bumps on it for an aerodynamic surface. So um, it has a lot of potential for both, um, for anything that requires flow control. So um, I went through that really fast. Um, so active textures have potential to integrate actuation, sensitivity, and energy harvesting all in one system. So all of those structures I showed you, you could have a fiber that's in charge of your actuation, another fiber that's in charge of your sensing, maybe something else that's in there that's harvesting energy to power all of this all at the same time. So the structure is really important in, to have these, where, to reach really integrated wearable devices. Um, and then we can create all sorts of kinematic motions. Some of them are not useful for wearable devices, but a lot of them are. Um, and we have predictive tools that can show um, that we can really tailor the performance. We also have um, these case studies that show the potential for flow control. So in, in general, I'm interested in aerospace structures, um, a lot of work on medical and rehabilitative devices. So that material I showed you is also biocompatible, so it can go on the body. So you have a tremendous potential to then change the shape of things within your body. Um, smart clothing and wearable technology, it is a textile. So you coat it with a, a normal fabric, a, a cotton or a, um, a wool, and you have a piece of clothing that can act on your body. And also robotic manipulators, so things that can grasp. It's a, it's a soft actuator, essentially. It's very flexible and can conform to whatever you're, you're interacting with. Um, and so you saw I did a lot of modeling, design. Um, everything is experimentally validated as well and manufacturing. So how you put these things together is so important in order to guarantee the performance. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge the MinDrive Robotic Sensor and Advanced Man Manufacturing Initiative, and also the graduate students, Kevin Eschen and Tim Anderson, who helped put some of this work together. Um, and at that, I'll open the floor for questions. Oh, it's, it disappeared. <laughs> Can you talk about how much heat is actually needed to make these materials change shapes? Sure. I'm thinking about having a shirt or something literally on my body and how hot it would need to be to so have those properties is, change. Um, nickel titanium is a shape memory alloy. And the transformation temperature of everything I showed you is 70 or 90 degrees Celsius. However, they have a whole, you can, t the manufacturers of the wire tweak the composition of the wire in order to set that temperature. So all the biomedical devices that are implanted in the body have um, transition temperatures that are closer to body temperature. So you could get something that was, say, 40C um, that wouldn't, that within a cloth structure wouldn't harm the body. And then... Um, you could use that wire in order to apply in the structure. I'm just wondering about maintenance. So thinking like future, mm -hmm. if this is like a shirt that I were to wear, like yeah. how would you clean it and, and how well would it hold up? But, you know, would it be a one-off or, you know, just thinking um, about durability and washing? As so you'd have to be careful what the temperature you wash it at. Um, so you'd probably do a cold wash in order not to, to overheat it. Um, to overheat it, though, you have to go up to 500C. So I, you're not going to do that in your washer. Um, so it should be fine. It, you, anytime it heats up, all you have to do is stretch it back out, and it will reform. Just like your sweater, if you throw your sweater, it's doing the same. Mechanically, it's doing very similar thing as your sweater when it shrinks up when, after you throw it in the laundry, so you can pull it out. This one doesn't show that permanent deformation, though, because of the wire structure. I have just started co-knitting with um, more textile-like fabrics and the material. 
um, so I haven't gotten to the washing and drying part of it. It's more of the manufacturing aspect of how do I get it through the machine at the same time and get the structure that I want. Question from our online audience. Uh, Eric wants to know if you could review a few additional applications for roadway safety. Sure. Um, well, you can have traditional, um, like, wearables. So you can make a cuff out of this easily that would respond and tighten. And so you could couple that um, with a normal system that you would use for safety. Um, uh, and then for safety, a lot of your inflatables, there's a lot of potential with inflatables to combine this t um, more rigid conformable structure that can be tweaked by the wearer, like for each wearer, um, in order to get the shape. So that inflatable vest could have some application, um, airbags. Um, let's see. This is the ones that are coming to mind, this, the, the ones that I've thought of so far. Um, so, um, so it's like a, the, the fabric is made by repeating a fundamental unit. Mm -hmm. So if part of it gets damaged, so does it affect the actuation? Like it's for like safety purpose or when you use it in a control surface in a car or an air, uh, on an aircraft? Mm -hmm. So what's the redundancy in the system? Well, the ones I've created so far do not have redundancy. I've started putting um, different elements through so you can get the functionality, you have the flexible open structure of the knit, but you can, if you put your woven structure through carefully, you can provide extra support, but still allow for motion. So you can add redundancy in that way. And you can also layer things on top of each other. Um, so that if one fails, um, you still get the behavior from the other so that you don't completely fail. So like, um do you see, like, as this technology becomes more mature, that it could replace, you know, technologies that are mature today? So, for example, like, flaps on an aircraft wing. Could you see a future where there's no, you know, electromechanic, like, a, you know, mm -hmm. standard actuators or hydraulic mechanical? Um, this in, com in various forms. So you might not just have a knit surface. You might have this, and uh, you might have a knitted surface, but you might also have a woven surface. Um, your knitted surface is going to allow those large deformations, but maybe it's too porous, so you might have to have another layer to provide your um, aerodynamic surface. And you might have to add in extra actuators if you want to um, be able to do both your, like if you have layered actuators, maybe one's responsible for twists, one's responsible for bumps, one's responsible for elongation of your wing, and things like that. Um, this is fundamental work, so that's not in the near future. Um, but yes, you could start to start layer things together in order to create your morphing wing or your morphing surface of whatever you might be interested in. We have an online. Oh, we have another online question. Uh, Eric online also wants to know: Would any of the airflow or other applications of this technology be useful for preventive purposes on automobiles, or just mainly for reducing harm when an accident occurs? Can you repeat that? So wondering, um, he, he qualifies, he's a non-engineer perspective here. Um, he's wondering if any of the applications of this technology be useful for preventing um, preventative safety in automobiles, or would it be more about uh, reducing harm when a crash occurs? Um, it could be preventative if you have different areas of your body that could provide warning. So maybe you have another set of sensors that are tracking your behavior. If you're going too fast, maybe one area will provide haptic feedback. If you're going, if you have an impending curve, maybe another area will provide haptic feedback. So you could have using the distributed nature and you can locally actuate things. That's how you can provide feedback to prevent accidents. Yeah, I just want to follow up and just get a question on that. Is if you could use it for like sensing if a driver is falling asleep or any kind of um, that it kind does, of. With this material, the knit structures aren't the best sensors. Um, you can use them to sense displacement, but they're pretty slow. So you'd want to use a different sensor, but the variable stiffness could maybe um, change your head position or like keep your head upright. 
um, if you ha are falling asleep. So you could provide that feedback from another sensor system that could possibly integ be integrated in the textile as well. So with these materials, is there a lifespan associated with them in terms of after X number of uses, the performance degrades? Yes. Um, if you stay within certain design marks, you can get millions of cycles. Um, I have a student now that is working on lifetime performance studies of how, so how do you design these so that you can get that infinite performance. And we're just starting that work. So we can do hundreds of cycles for sure. Um, with steady performance, but we really, I mean, we don't know lifetime yet. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Um, so, um, you know, some of the more traditional actuators, like the, the hydraulic and the pneumatic, yeah. They have high bandwidth, uh, at least the mm -hmm. hydraulic ones, and high, um, uh, very large forces. Yes. Um, so for some of the automotive applications, uh, you know, like mm -hmm. um, airbags and so on, you, prob you probably need high bandwidth. Um, and to some actuate others, them, but if you're combining this system with a pneumatic system still, so you can do this combined, you can have a high bandwidth actuator, but then you can use the variable stiffness and the mechanical performance of the structure in order to, um, that can be built into the structure. So this is a different than n most knitted structures because you can also do it in a super elastic phase, which I didn't discuss, but you have extra flexibility. So you get flexibility from the knit and you also get flexibility from the wire. So you get expanded flexibility than you would over a traditional textile alone. So you can have, a it can be used for damping and energy absorption. Okay. So you'd have, yes, it's never, the material I showed is never gonna be high bandwidth. You might, it's always gonna be a Hertz, maybe, uh, approximately. Um, but you combine other materials for your higher bandwidths or other actuation types. Okay, what about the levels of forces? How many, um, you know, Newtons or hundreds of Newtons? So it depends on the structure. So some of them are just a couple Newtons. Um, like that, long, that little thin tube, it's just a couple of Newtons. Um, the rib, the one that creates those accordion shapes for our aerodynamic, they're very strong. And I use weightlifting weights when we test them. Um, so, and their patch is this big. So you're talking kilopascal level of pressures over the surface. So they're substantial. They're not as high as your conventional actuators, but they give that distributed pressure across the surface. So it's really finding that tailored area in order where it's in, where you need, you can tailor for that force up to a point. Okay. Anyone else? All right, so if that's the end of our questions today, thank you so much for presenting in, uh, for us today. As a reminder, these seminars do carry on. Uh, next week we have uh, Brendan Murphy presenting, and let me get the exact title of his presentation. Um, safety in Numbers, Estimating Bicyclist Activity and Safety in Minneapolis. So feel free to tune in here in person or online, and until then, uh, thank you all for attending.